some verses here to be thinking on. Luke 1, verses 35 and 36. The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. A couple chapters later, this is John the Baptist speaking. As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I. And I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Luke chapter 3, just a couple chapters, a couple verses later. Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was open. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven. You are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Then John chapter 1, 33 and 34. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. I want to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit tonight. And not just the baptism, but also the Holy Spirit in general, how it operates, how it works in the lives of people. And I think it's very important for us to have an understanding of this so that there is a, um, a clarity about it. Because this is a subject, <laughs> I can't believe we're calling the Holy Spirit a subject. But He is a person that is greatly misunderstood. And probably one of the greatest reasons for separations within the denominations in the church has to do with the activity with the person of the Holy Spirit. So I want to kind of bring some clarity specifically to this subject of the baptism. I've been doing some studying on it. As well as also talk about, there's actually two different activities of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. So uh, I will probably focus a little bit more on the baptism side of it, but we need to see that there's two parts that play in to the Holy Spirit. So I think I want to start the actual teaching in John 14. I wanted you guys to see that in the gospel there's plenty of talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And it's an important thing for us to be thinking about. John 14 beginning in verse 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. So I like that phrase, another helper. What does that mean to you guys? There's already one to start with. There's already one to start with. Who's that? Jesus. Yeah. I love that idea. I've talked about this with you guys before, but I just, I, I love the idea that, number one, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit a helper. And the word is parakletos, which means has a couple different definitions. You might have counselor, you might have comforter in your scripture, or your version of scripture. Um, the idea is it's someone that comes alongside. Okay, It's a partner. And I think there is this concept that's a little bit foreign to humans, is the idea that God doesn't necessarily want to boss us around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise he would call himself other than, something other than leader, I'm sorry, other than helper call himself leader, authority, something, but he specifically uses this Greek word parakletos, which means he comes alongside. He's a comforter. So there's times where these disciples, he's telling them now, you guys realize that Jesus for the majority of these three years is preparing his disciples for when he's not there. That's a little bit of a sad thought, the idea that a leader's main job is to prepare you for when he's not there anymore, or she's not there anymore. But it's one of the greatest things a leader can do is to lead in such a way so that when he's not there, you can keep going. And so this is what Jesus is doing. He's preparing for his departure, and he's saying, this is necessary for you. You are going to need someone to comfort you because some stuff's going to start happening to you. You're going to need a comforter. And I think this is one of the main characteristics of the Holy Spirit. This is one of the first times Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit. And when he does here, if it's the first time in John that he does, he refers to him specifically in this way. You're going to need this guy. You're going to need me. You're going to need my spirit 
because there's going to be some things that you're going to go through that you're not going to be able to turn to man for. And we have substituted the activity and person of the Holy Spirit. We've substituted him and we've used other people. We've allowed other people to become who Holy Spirit is to us. I can't tell you how many husbands think their wife is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Uh-huh. I thought that was your job. My job? <laughs> yeah. No, I do not want that kind of pressure. That was true. If a lot of men thought that way, then why don't they listen? Like <laughs> we didn't why do you always Spirit ask questions right? I can't answer? <laughs> they just come to me. Randy, take care of It's you. a gift you have. <laughs> Keep your woman under control now, okay? <laughs> hey, I don't want any trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the Holy Spirit is so hard. I will ask the Father. He will give you another helper. So even Jesus sees himself in this same light. He sees, thank you, Lord. He sees himself as one who came alongside of the disciples. You even look, if you look at the last couple of verses of the chapter of the book of Mark, you'll see that he comes alongside of the disciples and he has one role. He confirms their words with signs and wonders. The whole point of the Holy Spirit is that it, it wants to come alongside of us and confirm that we're His. Confirm that their activity is authorized. Everything about the Holy Spirit in your life is to say, Yep, they're mine, and I'm, my, my Father is real, I am active, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm alive, and I'm working with my, my family, my people. That's the Holy Spirit's role. That is the Spirit of Truth. It's a Spirit of Truth. Whom the world cannot receive. This is a very important thought here. Because it does not see him. It doesn't mean the world can't have it activated upon them. Okay, we know later on, I'm not going to read the entire chapter of John 14. But even, and it goes into John 16. It begins to talk about what the role of the Holy Spirit is. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit in the world is to convict. <clears throat> Pretty much every one of us in this room, unless you were saved when you were like in the womb. At some point in time, you were convicted by the Holy Spirit. In other words, you were cut to the heart. You became, you became aware of how your activity was not aligning with your true identity as a son and daughter of God. So the Holy Spirit does work in the world, but the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? So the Holy Spirit in the world is, comes upon them and convicts. I, I remember doing this. I remember being in my college dorm, in my college apartment, not dorm, being convicted by the Holy Spirit after a very late night party. And I remember waking up just completely torn up by my actions. That I just, I got my best clothes on I could wear, and I just found a church somewhere in downtown Shippensburg, and I just walked in. I was more hungover than I had been in a long time. And I remember going into that church, and I think it was a United Methodist church. I'm not even sure. But I remember sitting in the back because I was so convicted. I didn't know what I was at the time. I knew, I know now that I was being convicted, but at the time I was just feeling so heavy. Like my act, my actions and my behavior were not were not right. I just knew they weren't right. And I remember sitting in the back of that church and I felt like I was being washed while I sat in that church. And it was like maybe 30 or 40 people that were all, I think the average age was probably about 60. And I, I was by far the youngest person there. I probably reeked of what I had imbibed in last night. And I just sat there and I felt like someone was just scrubbing my spirit. And it was the Holy Spirit. That's what he was doing. And that's what he does in the world. And then as you enter into relationship, you receive him. So when he says here, the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. I didn't know what was happening to me that day. I just knew there was something convicting me. There was someone upon my life. But then he says, but you know him because he abides with you and in you. So this is, a, this is the phrase I want to talk about tonight. There's two roles of the Holy Spirit. One is that He is with you. And two, He is in you. Okay? Those are going to be really important. Because these are two different, and these, these two different, He specifically separates them because you'll see throughout Scripture. Well, let me just give, let me give you the beginning from the end so I can really focus on baptism. Okay, the word baptism in the Greek is, is really not that far removed. It, it's baptizo, or 
Yeah, that's pretty much how you say it. Baptizo, which, which means to fully, completely immerse. That's what the word means. Okay? So, when Jesus talks about being baptized, whether it's John baptizing or Jesus baptizing in the Holy Spirit or Jesus telling his disciples, go and baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're going to baptize people Sunday afternoon. The idea is, is that we fully immerse them. Okay? So a sprinkling or a pouring isn't exactly the spirit of biblical baptism. It is we hold you down until the Bible bubbles stop. And then we bring you back up and we pray for your resurrection. No, you fully get immersed. You fully get every part. It actually means every part of you is wet. That's what the actual term for baptism means in the Greek. So when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are completely immersed in him. He covers you. There's not a part of you, body, soul, or spirit, that is not immersed in the person of the Holy Spirit. Okay? <clears throat> but then there's this also this other part, but that, that's the with you part. Then there's this in you part. This in you part is similar to when Paul says that no one can say Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Okay? <clears throat> there is a witness Scripture talks about, about God's Spirit witnesses with our spirit that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay? <clears throat> so there is a saving moment in all of our lives when the, bat, when the Holy Spirit witnesses with the Spirit on, remember the original us that we've talked about enough? I've drawn enough pictures, I think. That original us deep within us, the Spirit of who we are, connects with the Holy Spirit, and then there's this oneness that occurs. He breaks through our flesh, through our thought processes. Holy Spirit connects with original Spirit, original us, and we say, Jesus is Lord. Holy Spirit is in us in that moment. He breaks through, okay? So there's an in us, and then there is a with us. And the majority of the rest of Scripture, specifically in Acts, where we're going to go, is about the with us part. Okay? But the in you part is also very important because that's the part that transforms us day by day. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not necessarily a transformative thing. Oftentimes you just see it operating through you and, 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 a, and a, from you in power, from you in authority. We'll see what the with you and the baptism is about. But the in you is like we were making fun here a little bit of Courtney, but it's an actual truth, is that she's going through this transformative process, and we all are. Every one of us are. We're transforming from this old creation into this new creation. And it's finally when that Holy Spirit breaks through our flesh and begins to reconnect with the original us, our spirit, and then we're made new from the inside out. That's the restorative or the regenerative process that's happening in our lives. You with me so far? Okay. So, let's go. Keep going here. Verse 18 of John 14. I will not leave you as orphans. Jesus keeps reminding his guys of this. He says, look, I'm going to leave you, but you're not going to be orphans. You're not going to be without a father. That's what an orphan is. An orphan is a fatherless one. Okay? He says, I'm going to come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. That's a really important point. Because he's not going to be there anymore. He will not be physically with them, but he tells them, you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. If that's not underlined in your Bible, it should be. Because there is one of the key phrases from, that links us to 1 John 4.17 from Sunday. So just as he is in the world, so also are we. This is what he says here. Because I live, you live. He's talking about a oneness of relationship between his disciples and himself. Because I live, you will live. So, all right, I got it drawn. So I can't get away from it without doing this. Oh, God. That's the world's longest oh, neck. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So, this is original us. Okay? And then we've got that flesh nature here. I'm not going to use all the different colors, so I don't have that kind of time. Okay. So, <clears throat> this is Holy Spirit. This is all Romans 8 stuff, guys. We talked about this on our time. Okay. Romans 8, this is flesh, this is original us. When Holy Spirit breaks through, the, the, the transformative process that he's doing grows the inner us, grows our spirit until we fill up this space that used to be filled by the flesh. And we press this out, growing and growing and growing. And this Holy Spirit is really the spirit of Jesus. That's why he says, I will not leave you. 
It's his spirit that the Father sends. Okay? So this activity, <clears throat> his Holy Spirit, is Jesus. We're one and the same. His activity connects with our original us, which is nothing more than our spirit. Don't forget, most of the time in Romans 8 when it's talking about the spirit, though it's capital S, it's not really. It's actually more our spirit in Romans 8 than it is God's spirit, specifically in the first 13 verses. So his spirit connecting with our spirit, and that's where it says, you live equals we live. Okay? It's this idea that when I resurrect from the dead, guys, and I begin to, to reign in authority and in the power that has originally been mine all along, then I will cause you, your original you, your spirit, to come alive, and when you live, I will live. Okay? That's what he's talking about here. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you, where? In me, and I in you. Okay? There's this fullness, this, this oneness that Jesus loves to talk about. He eventually prays that in John 17. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself. I will show myself. I will reveal myself to him. Jump down to verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the Helper, Parakletos, the Holy Spirit... Whom the Father will send in my name. In other words, he and I are one. We're the same. He will teach you all things. Okay? So, the teaching all things is part of the in you. Okay? This part is... And he's, what else does it say? Let's just finish this. And he will remind you or bring to remembrance all that I've said to you. So one of the things that the Holy Spirit's called to do, have you ever been taught something from a long time ago and you forgot it and then Jesus or the Holy Spirit just comes in and reminds you of something you learned a long time ago and just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot that. That's what he does. Jesus is telling his disciples, look, the Holy Spirit's going to come and remind you of everything I taught you. But here's, here's just it. He says, this is a powerful thing. Not everything Jesus couldn't teach to his disciples. There was a lot of things he couldn't tell his disciples while they were on the earth. He says, he says you just can't bear them now. You'll find I couldn't read all of this to you. We spend all night here. But he tells his disciples later on, he says, look, there are as many things I want to teach you, Joey. I want to teach you so many things, but right now in your spiritual condition, because this is not completely restored, you can't handle it all. You're not going to be able to handle it all. So when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to remind you of everything I said, because this is the foundation. The foundation is what he's already told and then he's going to teach them everything else. He says, I'm going to lead them into all truth. This is powerful. I'm even going to say this with the camera on. There are things that are not in Scripture mm -hmm. that God has yet to teach man. It has to be. Because he says this right here. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. He's separating out those two thoughts. In other words, everything that I'm saying here in Scripture, good. But there's more. Oh boy, mind blown. A lot of fundamental Christians are literally jumping out of their skin right now as I'm saying that because there's more to learn. Even though the writers of the gospel say, do you know what? All the books in the world could not contain all the works of Jesus. So how could one book? This is a foundational thing. This Bible is good and it's beautiful. It's miraculous. But there's so much more. And it talks... It's, it's revealing to us that relationship with the Holy Spirit reveals more to us than what Scripture can. Yeah, that's right. And this is not a dangerous teaching. It's actually the teaching of the New Testament. It's the idea that Scripture is not the end-all, be-all. It's our foundation. It's an incredible place where we can gather and gain a, rep a representation of Jesus, but nothing beats being with Him. Yeah. Nothing beats walking with Him. I've used this example a hundred times. If someone wrote a book called Don Derniak, and I studied it every day, I would not know her the way I would know her if I walked with her every day. I mean, I think every wife would probably agree with that. Even if her parents wrote a book on Dawn and they gave it to me and said, if you want to have a good relationship with her, read this all the time. 
she would eventually take that book and light it on fire. Because I would not be paying attention to her, I'd be paying attention to a book. And unfortunately, too much of the church has done that. I'm not, please do not hear me disesteeming the Bible. Because in some places, this thing literally makes people weep when they have their first one. So please don't hear me. I'm simply saying this. That there's nothing that should replace walking with him, talking with him, being in relationship with him. And that's what Jesus says here. It's great. He's going to remind you of everything that already has been said. But there's more. So much more. More that, and, and what Holy Spirit says to Ephelo will be very specific to what Ephelo is experiencing in life. Who she's made, who, how she's made to be. Who she's made to be. And as a result of that, what Aaron hears from Holy Spirit, if they compare notes and say, no, 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 this is what Holy Spirit says. No, this is what Holy Spirit, you know, there's this argument that begins to take place and happens in the church all the time. It's like me saying, I could teach you guys how to be married. Okay? I can teach you how to be the best husband in the world. The problem is I only really know how to be a good husband to one person. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. This is a really important truth for us to realize. That this is such a unique relationship. He is the same yesterday and today and forever, but he's also incredibly personal, and he speaks specific things to you. If Dawn says very specific things to me, and I assume that every other wife on the planet is telling their husband the same thing. How right am I? No way. If it would be that easy, then we would just have all these classes on how to be a husband, and we could just train everybody robotically. We all know, ladies, that that's not true. It's that relational. It's that, it's, it's that intimate. And because of each one of us being as unique as we are, this relationship is so unique. Are there foundational truths for all of us? Absolutely. But there's some very specific things that he says to Sherry that he doesn't say to me. That doesn't make her right and me wrong. It means that she's having an imper a personal encounter. And when she reveals what the Holy Spirit's doing in her life, I get excited and I get more color added to my life. You know why? Because he's not talking to me that way. It's the beauty of this relationship in the body of Christ. It's so necessary. All right, enough of that. You guys okay? You want more of that? No. Oh, okay. I'll give you more of that. Give me a peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You guys hear he's preparing his guys. He's preparing them. You heard that I said to you, I'm going to go away, but I will come to you. And if you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to my father. That's kind of harsh. They're not rejoicing in the fact that he's leaving. Okay? They're actually pretty sad. They're like, what are we going to do now? It's just like all of you guys. You know, if, if the most important person in your life said, oh, by the way, next week, I'm out. What? You're out? You're gone? Yeah, but don't worry. My spirit's going to be with you. How much comfort is that going to bring you? Yeah, this is Jesus. It's the one they've been waiting for for generations upon generations. If you have loved me, you have rejoiced because I go to my Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it does happen, you may believe. All right, jump down a couple chapters to John 20. This is after his death, after his resurrection. It was on the evening of that day, verse 19, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. What a powerful statement. You guys, don't blow over that statement. Can we read that again? Peace be with you. What's the next phrase? As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Just, can we just sit there for a second? In the exact same way that the Father has sent the Son. So how did the Father send the Son? Through Mary. Okay, through Mary. That's a good start. Mary and? Ah, thank you. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit. 
Remember, that's why I read those verses in the, the very first verse I read to you, that the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and you will bring forth a son. Okay? So in the same way that Jesus is sent, so are we. Do not think you're just seed of a natural mom and a natural dad. You are not. Because in the same way Jesus is sent, so also are we. Natural seed, Holy Spirit. What else? How else was Jesus sent? Anybody? There's no wrong answer. I just want to hear what you're thinking. Okay, came as a human and came as a spirit. You guys know it's completely natural to be human and spirit. Jesus was modeling a way we would walk and live. I think he came humbly. Like he didn't come and Beautiful. wasn't born and had a throne put upon his head. Yeah. He was a king, but he lived to serve. Yeah. He was led. He was led. He allowed himself to be led. Absolutely. I don't do anything unless I, follow, I see my father do it. I don't say anything unless I see him do it. I don't, if he, if he, I don't even say anything unless I hear him say it. It's that powerful of a relationship. He was led. And he even says that he was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted. Oh, my goodness. The Holy Spirit sends us to be tempted. Oh, that's not God. No, God wouldn't do that. Yeah, you know. It's the same God that allows Satan into his presence. You guys know this, right? Job. Where was Satan? Yeah, in Job. And it's not just once, twice. Just in that book alone, we see that Satan is walking among the sons of God in the presence of the Lord. Hmm. What is up with that? I've always heard it said that, uh, no, uh, evil and good can't re reside in the same Sin can't reside in the presence of God. Stop it. It's not scriptural. It's not. I even believe that someone can be filled with the Holy Spirit and be oppressed by a spirit. Absolutely. It's just, which one are you going to allow to win? Which one are you going to feed? Which one are you going to give precedence to? I mean, look, we can see this here. You can be in Christ. What's the very first verse of Romans 8 say? good. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why would I even think about having condemnation if I'm in Christ Jesus? Because there's still flesh. You guys realize that there is still flesh while we're in Christ. And in flesh, we've talked about this before, is the law of what? Sin and death. This is where condemnation comes from. So this law of sin and death can be operating in the exact same place where the law of life, that's what the other law is, is working in our bones. These are what create that war that Romans 7 talks about. This, oh, there's something on the inside of me that wants to do good, but then there's another law at work in my members. This is what he's talking about. He sets the stage in Romans 7 for Romans 8. This is what's going on. So we can have all of this incredible Holy Spirit activity going on in our lives, and then we can also flesh out on somebody. <laughs> Has it ever happened? <laughs> Come on. Absolutely. You know, there's a part of you that thinks, oh my gosh, the Holy Spirit left me. He's gone because there's no way he could be in the presence of that little session I just had. And I believe in that moment he draws closer. I believe that's how love covers a multitude of sins. How else can love cover if he runs off every time we sin? No, he has to draw near. Love covers. Grace is, is what causes us to come alive. In order for us to literally become who we're supposed to be, grace must go through. Look at this. It must break through some pretty ugly crap. Mm -hmm. to get to the real us, to grow this real us, to grow this out. You would not believe how much the Lord's willing to put up with in order to be in relationship with us. Yeah, you probably do believe it. Yeah. Just as he has sent me, I send you. Okay, where am I? 22. 
When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? Very important. Then, I don't really want to explain this verse, verse 23, but just trust me, we'll talk about that at some point in time. But verse 22 is the thing I want you to see. He breathes on them and he says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? That receiving is more of the in you part. Remember he says that he would send them and he would teach them all things and remind them of the things that I had taught them. Okay? That's the in you part of this. The with you part of it is coming. We're going to see this in a minute. Any questions so far on where we're going? So we're going to get into some good stuff here. Randy. Um, we were always taught that when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you, you miraculously obtain this gift of speaking in tongues. Is that part of it? Okay. I'm only talking about the in you part. The with you part is about to come. Okay. okay. Get ready. Anybody else? Any other questions? So that's a delineation I didn't know. That that, that ex those expressions are with and not in as part of. Well, let's talk about some of the more in use of Scripture. Um, again, I didn't want to... The emphasis was going to be here, but I think this is another good one. Um, another one is that He seals us. Holy Spirit seals us unto redemption. This is in Ephesians. Okay, You can look that one up for yourselves. But there's this ongoing work of the Holy Spirit inside of us. That's what the whole Romans 8 one's all about. Romans 8 and Acts chapter 2... The baptism, the fire, the tongues are two different activities of the Holy Spirit. Okay? One is an inward work, the other one is an outward work. Very important for us to realize. Okay? Just like uh, yeah, I'll use I'll use a husband as an example. Okay? As a husband is, he eight hours a day, or any of you that work outside the home, you have a role outside the home. That's different than a role inside the home. Am I right? Okay? You don't, most of you do not cook dinner where you work. Most of you. Maybe some of you do. Okay? The point is there's things that you do in the home with your husband or wife, with your children, with your family that you do not do at work. Why? Because there's a role you play out here that's different than a role you play inside your home. In fact, sometimes, in some cases, there is so much stress and anxiety and energy that's, that you're operating in here, that you almost have to take that off before you can walk in your home mm -hmm. and be the mom or the dad or the husband or the wife. Can someone say amen? Yep. amen? Yeah, okay? That's exactly what we're talking about here. Holy Spirit, same guy. You're the same person in the workplace as you are at home, but you have a different role. There's a different activity. There's different responsibilities. So the responsibility that the Lord has in us is different than the responsibility he has without us. Okay? Not only without us, but also he's working in the world convicting, like we talked about earlier. So he has multiple roles, even in our own lives. Okay? So, this in you part is he's teaching us. He's continuing to teach us original me to strengthen us and mature us so we grow and eventually fill up to the full measure that belongs to the statue of Christ, Ephesians 4. He reminds us of everything he taught us so that the foundation remains strong. He seals us unto redemption. One of the, my favorite analogies with the seals us is the parable of the sower. And he goes out to sow, and he sows in the, you know, some seed falls on good soil, some seed falls on rocky, some on thorny, some on path. Okay? And that three quarters of his seed is ruined. Three quarters of his seed does not produce any results. Only one quarter of his seed produces the 30, 60, and 100 fold. Here's the beauty of what the Holy Spirit does. His job is that the work that is done in us is sealed tight. His work in us almost securely fastens the work of Jesus to our spirit so that it cannot be removed. Mm. It's John 10. No one can steal them out of my hand. Well, the Holy Spirit's job is to seal us and protect our spirits. So when seed gets in there, his job is to make sure... No one steals that seed. No doubt, no fear, no demon, no persuasive words, no offense, anything like that can steal the seed that Jesus has sown in us. Anywhere else you can think of in Scripture the role of the Holy Spirit in us? <clears throat> Russ? I think it goes right along with that seal, sealing part. It's where it is in uh, 2 Corinthians where it says the Holy Spirit is a foretaste of what God has said prepared for us later on. Yeah. It's like 
if you can even wrap your mind around what the Holy Spirit is to us, who he is to us, that's just like the tip of the iceberg of what's waiting for us. Can I confirm that? Run to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 really quick. Verse 9, just as, as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the what? Heart. Heart of man. We're talking about the inside of each one of us. All that God has prepared for those who love him. Stop. This is an Old Testament verse. Okay? In the Old Testament verse, it talks about things that our eye has not seen yet, things our ear has not heard yet things that have not yet entered into the heart of man, these things God has already prepared for those who love us, love him, okay? So he's prepared these things for us. And in the Old Testament, he had not shown them to us yet. However, look at verse 10. For to us, God revealed them where? Through the Spirit. What's that word revealed? What tense is that? Past tense. And it's the same in the original language. The idea is that when Holy Spirit comes and he enters into Julia, he reveals everything about that foretaste, that future, all that God has prepared for Rob and for Julia specifically since we're talking about her. He puts it all on the inside of her. Here's what I believe. I believe it's always in here. I believe it's always been in there. Deep within him. Back when we were being formed and shaped in our mother's womb. Before, it's God's dreaming and thinking and planning and purposing us. He lays it all in there. And then this whole process, Romans 8, Holy Spirit, drilling down to reveal this, is to release all of those thoughts. Why? Because the Holy Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Okay? So if he searches the depths of God, I promise you, he also searches the depths of us. In fact, I'm not so sure that this original me isn't analogous, at least analogous, if not equal to, the depths of God. Think about it a minute. I have four natural children. Dawn and I have four natural children. And when I drill down deep on the inside of my children, what are you going to find? Your DNA. Mm -hmm. Me. My DNA. The reason why they exist is because mom and I each donated DNA and they exist. Mm -hmm. So if he's the creator of all things, his spirit is what breathed life into us. When you dig down on the inside of a person, what do you find? You find him. So the spirit searches all things, even the depths of... He's finding himself in us and then causing that to come forth. That's what's already been revealed. Holy Spirit, job inside of us, inside of us, is to reveal all that he ever put on the inside of us. Even it says in Ecclesiastes, where is eternity set? Eternity was placed where? In the hearts of men. Eternity. From, the, from there is no beginning to there is no end. That's the definition of eternity. It's in the hearts of men. Men who are born and die. It's in us. Eternity is set in our hearts. I think that's this. I don't think we have any, <laughs> I don't think we think we can scratch the surface of the potential of a human being. It's incredible. And the Holy Spirit's job, inwardly, is to bring forth all of that greatness, all of that purpose. That's why it's so sad for people to completely ignore the working of the Holy Spirit. It's crazy. This is, he actually is in our lives not only to be a helper and a consoler and a comforter, but to actually bring forth all the greatness that's on the inside of us. He's the one that does it. Oh, no, 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 no. The Holy Spirit's not for this day and hour. Nope, no. I'm just glad I'm saved, hallelujah. So I have a question. So then if somebody doesn't believe and isn't saved, the Holy Spirit is still in there. Well, because their God... spirit is in there. Their spirit is in there. But they, uh, John 14 says he cannot receive the spirit. Now there are, the DNA of God is in there. That I agree with. But the Holy Spirit is waiting to be received. Remember how John 14, we just read that? It says, the world cannot receive him, but you have received him. 
In other words, when you said yes to Jesus, the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit kept working on you and working on you, and finally you said, I surrender. And it's like, wow! He brings, he finally breaks through, he brings this alive to the point where you're just like, yes, yep, something rings true. The DNA, the original God DNA, rings true with Holy Spirit DNA, and you say, yes, Jesus is Lord. That's how it happens. And then the rest of this life we live is that how close can these two things get? How much of Holy Spirit we can get in, how much of original us that can Holy Spirit get out? Then it makes sense whenever you compare a fire to the Holy Spirit. There you go. Because it ignites it. Come on. I'm also thinking it's really... It makes sense that um, as soon as the Holy Spirit comes in, it seems like in your natural life things seem to go worse. Because, because really that, that which is within you now is contrary to the world yeah. and is completely... Yeah. yeah, if anyone tells me that they get saved or they go to a new place in God and life gets better, <laughs> I question their revelation of God. <laughs> it's true. I mean, we were just, we were, Julie and I were talking about this today. She's like, she is going to a completely new and deeper place in the Lord. And there's part of her that thinks she's absolutely going crazy. <laughs> and there's another part of her that's so excited and so joyful and so hungry. Does anybody identify with that? Yes. Like, there's this inside of you, you were talking about, like, this holy riot, right? You're talking about this. Like, these two things are going on. You're like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to die. And you're, like, happy about it. <laughs> and that's exactly what goes on when the Holy Spirit's at work. Because I think you make a great point, Diane. Some of this that's on the inside of us scares the living bejesus out of us. Sorry. But it's because this is our reality. We've lived so long as this person that it's become us. It's a false identity. It's an identity we were never meant to live by. And so we get used to limitation. We get used to limping. We get used to offenses. We get used to bondages and weights and burdens that were never meant for us. And then Holy Spirit ignites our spirit. And then those things, there's a period of time in each one of our transitions, in each one of our season changes, where new life comes out and decides to mingle with flesh. And that is not a happy reunion. It's not. It's like a riot. It is. And these things are ugly. But the reality is they're coming to drive this stuff up to the surface to get it out. It's the whole reason why it's there. As it comes up, it comes up, it comes up. Flesh doesn't have anywhere to go. Oh my gosh, what's going on? So the first thing flesh does is it pushes back. It fights because it doesn't want to leave. It's grown accustomed to it. And we've grown accustomed to it. So now this battle's going on in Romans chapter 7. The very thing that I want to do deep within me is a completely different thing than what my members are saying to do and what they're telling me to do. And before long, I'm really ticked off, but I'm really happy, and I feel like I'm schizophrenic. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's healthy. Let it happen. The worst thing you can do is resist it. How do you let it happen, though? That's what I'm having problems with. Ever since I started coming here, I feel like I have no idea who I am anymore. And I fight it every day, all the time, and I get so sick of it that I just want to run away from me. I'm sick of being me. So what does surrender look like? I had no idea we'd get stuck on the in you. This is good. What does surrender look like? What, if, if as this comes alive, as Holy Spirit drills down and brings this alive, and the flesh and the spirit really begin to tussle, what does surrender look like? Right now, it's nothing. Right now, I say nothing. If somebody says something to me, I say nothing. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. Like, what do you mean? Somebody like says something. Anything. Like, if they say something. Like a question about the Lord. A question about the Lord, or a question on like just life in general. Like. Is it because I always you're, just, Is it because you're stuck right now with what you've always known, versus what you're now seeing, that you don't know? Yeah, and like I told my mom, like <clears throat> the closer I get to the Holy Spirit. The more afraid I get because I'm not used to that person. It's true. So I just kind of am lost. It's kind of like you're mourning who you used to be. Yeah. 
like I'm a manager at my work and there are times where I feel like I can't even manage because I don't know me. I hate to say it, but you're in absolutely the best place you can be right now. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> and let that process have its finish. Sometimes you just need to spend a season of not saying anything. It's okay. It's, it's okay to not have But everybody's answer. making me say things. Like, they're, when there's problems, like, at my work or wherever, like, they were wanting me to say something, and I want to say something, but I just don't know how to say it. And that comes as a shocker to so many people, probably even my husband. Because before, I used to just tell you how I felt and walk away and not even care about how you feel about the words that came out of my mouth. Mm. Now, it's so different. Mm. But that's you learning to listen to the Holy Spirit and hear yeah. conviction. And so as you respond, I mean, even if you make a mistake, it's okay if you don't respond the right way. But you're tuning in and getting convicted by the Holy Spirit. And it's just a process of learning how to hear the Holy Spirit and respond from that. Because the Holy Spirit will tell you how to respond. And even if you don't do it the right way, you'll know it. And then you'll start to learn and get really tuned in. I think, too, the whole in part is a realization that we are seated with him in heavenly places and to remember that we're operating out of the spiritual. We're operating out of seated in heavenly places. And just saying something off the cuff in that setting, when you're viewing somebody as potentially seated in heavenly places, and if not, there's a chair ready for them. Mm -hmm. When you see from that perspective, then you have the right things to say. But it's so easy to forget that that's where we are. It's so fast to just, you know, forget that that's yeah. we're seated there. Um, you know, one of the things, Becky, I just want to remind you of is that you're really starting to care for people in a different way than you ever have before. The Lord's giving you a compassion for people that he has for them. And as a result, you can't just say anything you used to say can't just respond with the first thing that comes off the top of your head because now you're beginning to live from this person. And it takes time to learn how to live from this person. You can't just all of a sudden, oh yeah, I got this. I tell you, it's a lifetime of practicing to live from here. Living from your spirit, living from your core, your original you. It's a lifetime of an achievement process that goes on. And in the meantime, this Becky, who you have become accustomed to being, is not interested in leaving. And because this is where the enemy takes a foothold, and I don't like to blame him, I don't like to give him any more power than he has, but every time we lay any flesh upon ourselves, we give him authority. It is the truth, okay? Just like Adam and Eve, that one decision, one decision they made outside of relationship with the Lord, and they gave the enemy a foothold. That forever changed the destiny of this earth. It doesn't take that much. This is a process, and I can't answer your how question, because just like we were talking about earlier, as intimate of a relationship as you and Randy have, that there's only certain things, like if you guys were having issues, I could maybe counsel some generalities, but the specifics are going to have to be just worked out between the two of you. How much more intricate is the relationship you have with the Holy Spirit? He is your counselor. He is. So when you're right here in this moment asking the question you're asking, He's the best one to ask. He's your paracletos. He's your helper. There's no better person to rely on. I never right see now. then the flesh part of me is always like, mm -hmm. oh, you're going to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. You're going to screw up. Yeah. And so you I are. Still yeah. And you will. Just do it. <laughs> see, that's the yeah. performance-based mentality that you, mm -hmm. that, you that, that needs to kind of go. We're all dealing with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We all are. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I know I grew up in a home that was very performance-oriented. I know we had a church here for a long time that was very performance oriented. And to have that culture just leave in a day, not going to happen. The idea of making a mistake and it's okay and we're actually going to come closer and love you through that and say, way to go, you tried, you made a mistake, yes! <laughs> Celebrating mistakes, let's do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Means you're moving. We'd be partying all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one more thought. Go ahead. No, I think that's, that's what I was going to say, is I think it really takes a lot for us to understand that we're still going to be accepted and loved, maybe even more, mm -hmm. for our mistakes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, please. Um, I, 
I mean, my parents are divorced, but off and on, I've put that mentality on myself of performance-based and like, I don't want to mess up, I want to make them proud, blah, blah, blah. And um, as I've grown older, Jesus is breaking me of that. And one of the ways that I feel like it's being broken is lots of opportunities where I can choose to do the right thing or I make a mistake. And like I'm learning to accept that. And as I accept it, then I realize that the people in my life that I was trying to please, that they don't want that. Like I can screw up royally and my dad's like, hey, I love you. Like, let's get through it. So I think the hardest part sometimes is that battle against yourself. Because it is, like, for me it was hard to learn it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to whatever and, like, say the wrong thing. Yeah, I've, I've been through my fair share of stuff with Dad the past couple of years. And once I learned to accept it and just be upfront and this is what I did, like, it's very, very beautiful to have people accept you in that place. But it's hard because you're so vulnerable and you're used to not being like that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it is... The more that Jesus breaks you, I feel like more of those opportunities come to allow you to be broken. But it's like it's so beautiful. It really, really is. Yeah. Gosh, can our brokenness be more beautiful? I see you, sweetheart. <laughs> can our brokenness be more beautiful than when we were trying to be whole? Um, I think that's what you're trying to say. I don't think that there's anything that he attracts him more to us than our vulnerability. I think that is such a characteristic that we need to embrace because I think that just draws him so close to us mm -hmm. is when we are completely vulnerable. And that's why his power is made perfect where? In weakness. It's it's just right. In our weakness. I think the more vulnerable we could be, the more weak we could be, the more, more broken we can be, the yeah. more incredibly, like, well, I think that incredibly if we were, awesome. If we weren't all broken, we wouldn't think that we even need God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but we don't act like, we don't live life from that platform. We, Not enough, that's for no. sure. No. Nope. We constantly, Chile and I were talking a lot about this today, we try to be strong, try to act like we got it all together, because yeah. we're all leading, we all got stuff that people want from us, we got to act like, you're a manager, you said it yourself, mm -hmm. my people are looking to me for answers, I got to act like I got it all together. So we put on this show for everybody. Oh, I got this. I got it all figured out. I'm a mom. I got, I'm, a, I'm a boss. I got kids. I got whatever. And, you know, sometimes when people see your vulnerability, it's amazing how they want to come and serve I think, and work alongside. I think of that as when you forget that you're seated in heavenly places and you just operate out of, like, here's this good information that I remember being taught. And there you go. That'll fix it. Mm -hmm. Instead, and, and it very well could be a very good piece of it, but if it's not what God has at that moment. Yep. Last one. Go ahead. Wave the arm. I think that the reason you feel like you don't know what to say or what to do is because you do know that the part of you before was not really, I don't know how to say, I don't think that in the wrong way, that, that you were a bad person. And now you want to become this wonderful person and you don't know how to do it because you, you feel like if you let yourself go, other people's going to come and you know, bust you around just because you, you are a manager. So my thing it is accept who you become and uh, try to just hear the law and uh, don't learn how to talk to other people because you just said you, you just said it that you didn't care you would say what you, it, it is on your mind and then you walk away without even knowing how you feel trying to put yourself in other people's shoes and think if you talk to them the way you talk to them or if they talk to you like that how you're gonna feel and I think that way you probably know how you can be able to talk to Jesus. I want to honor you, Becky, because I think since we started this Bible study, I don't think anyone has learned and transformed more than you mm -hmm. of everyone that's come here. And I think everyone that's been coming here, we can probably say that too. And it's because you are the one most willing to be vulnerable. I mean, just think about it, guys. Those of you that have been around this for a while, who was the one that would ask the most questions? Becky. Who would break down every week? Like she just did. And as a result, she's experiencing the most change. So I honor you for being the broken one. And as a result, you're the most changed one. It's powerful. 
It's confusing. I don't even want to say thank you because I don't even like where I'm at right now. <laughs> yeah, you actually so. don't like. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. Trust the process. And that's flesh wanting you to find the good. Yeah, that's good. Curry. Please remember what she just said. Every time you want to run, that's your flesh saying, "You don't need this. You don't need this. Get out of here. Get out of here before it gets worse." Run while it's only, only this bad. Because it is so easy to walk away from the pain that you're dealing with and go back to how you were. Yeah. Because you know that. You were comfortable with that. You know you were okay being that way because it's just how you've been so used to operating. So to go through that pain, is sometimes it is so much easier to just be like, okay, I'll go back to where I was. Yep. That's where we that pain is royal. Than where we were. Yeah. Process in the Holy Spirit's painful, guys. I don't know if you guys saw last week or a couple days ago, Lauren, my daughter, put up something on Facebook about how hard the pain is, but she knows how good it's. I forget what she said. It's healthy. It hurts like hell. She said pain is healthy. There you go. All that. Hell and vital and good and growth and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, someone started posting a comments on her underneath about how if you feel pain, that's not God. Yeah, I'm trying to say, look, that's a sign that something's wrong. Change quickly. Get out of whatever situation's causing you to have pain. And that is, like when some people, like if you experience pain in your body, your body automatically says, you know, fight or flight, right? When mm -hmm. you experience pain, it's one of the two things. It's a completely different response in the spirit. It's like working out. Completely Jesus different. Huh? I'm, so I'm, glad Jesus didn't I'm sure glad Jesus didn't do that. It's like working out. It's building new strength and muscles you didn't have before. Okay. Can we talk about the power side? Can we talk about the fun <laughs> side of Holy Spirit? Okay. Yeah. Acts chapter 1. I guess this is real power too. That we're talking about. <clears throat> By the way, who wrote Acts? Very good. The first account I composed, Theophilus, that's who he's writing to. He's writing to a friend. I want to try to give you an account of what's happened after Jesus died. I got to show you guys. This is the real deal. So he's actually composing uh, a basic uh, a timeline on the growth of the first church about all that Jesus began to do and teach. So actually, the book of Luke and this book are just really a combination of the two. You can almost end Luke and walk right into Acts and see a whole lot of corollaries. Until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by what? The Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. The word apostles there means sent ones. Remember what he said at the end of John? Just as the Father has sent me, I send you. That's why they're called apostles. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, so important. But to wait for what the Father had promised. What did the Father promise? Helper. John 14. What did he say? Helper. I'm going to send you a helper. The Father's going to send you a helper. You're not going to be orphans. The promise is you're going to always have us with you. We'll never leave you. We'll never forsake you. This is how. Which he said, you heard from me. Verse 5. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Oh boy. I would love if he came to us and said, God, don't leave. Because if you wait not many days from now, the baptism's coming. Oh, That's it. Come on. Man, this, that just makes me excited. Just to think about that. So, when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times and epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive... I think that's what it sounds like in the Greek. <laughs> you will receive power. Dunamis. That's where you get the English word dynamite. It's that kind of power. It's explosive power. It's authority. It's force. It's heavenly force. You will receive this power 
when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Okay, this with you is also the upon you. It's different than the in you process. Okay, this is a different thing. The Holy Spirit was already, look, look, this is how we know that these are two different processes. Because in John 20, he breathes upon them to receive the Holy Spirit. These are the same disciples that he says, don't leave until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Upon you. Well, you just breathed it in us, but there's also an upon, okay? You guys with me? That's why there's two different things here. Okay. <clears throat> Holy Spirit will come upon you, and here, right here, is the number one, most important, absolute, highest, no better one attribute of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You shall be my witnesses. Jerusalem, in Judea, in, Judea, in Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. For those of you that don't know geography very well, Jerusalem was what? Hello? The city, okay? Technically, like today, it's considered the capital of Israel, okay? So, it's kind of a locale. It's a local. It's like God coming to us and saying, and you're going to be my witnesses in Chambersburg. Okay? And then he says Judea, which is a geographic next region out. It's a region of Israel. And then it goes beyond this into Samaria. Okay, so far these two are very Jewish oriented areas. Okay? But then he says the next one, which is the next geographic region that's farther out, it's Samaria. This is where who lives? Samaritans. Oh, right. Yeah. Samaritans, otherwise known as... Gentiles. He's giving them a hint. This thing is not just for Jews anymore. That woman at the well, remember I showed you that picture when you guys were hanging out with me and we told her and we went to her house and we prophesied over her about the husbands and all that and I went to her house. That's what I was showing you, that this is one day going to be about this. And then where's the last one? The remotest parts of the earth. This Holy Spirit's job was to come upon the disciples and they would go to all of these places. There'd be no part that they wouldn't go to. They would be witnesses. That Greek word is martos, where you get your English word, Lord. He uses that word very specifically because every one of these guys is martyred for their faith. Hallelujah. After he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you look into the sky? This Jesus who is taken from you up into heaven will come to you in just the same way, blah, blah, blah. Okay, verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. So where was he when he ascended? On the Mount of Olives cross from the temple, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. And just so you know, they pick a 12th disciple. Okay? That's what they do there. Let's jump to chapter 12, 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on Pentecost, but if you go to Leviticus 23, you can see what that particular Jewish feast is about. It's a specific Jewish feast. They were there. They were in the upper room. And it says that the day had come, and they were all together in one place. And it talks about how while they're... Some things I skipped in Acts 1 is how they were in this upper room daily praying together. Eagerly doing exactly what Jesus told them to do right before he ascended on high. They're waiting. But they're not just waiting like watching Netflix videos waiting. They're intently waiting. They are anticipating a waiting. And when you were told that not many days from now, power is going to come from on high, I don't think I would have anything other than incredible anticipation of what's coming. And he says, he, didn't, he was very non-specific with them. Sometimes Jesus is very specific, other times he's non. And so they're there every day in one accord, and they don't want to leave. They're told not to even leave Jerusalem. They don't even want to leave the room. 
And all the disciples are there, and it says the women that are with them, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. They're all there in that upper room. And it says, when they were all together in one place, suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled. Now that's a word you want to underline because you're going to see that throughout Acts and even later on in the rest of the New Testament, that term filled, we're going to define it in a minute. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. There you go, Randy. As the Spirit was giving them utterance. Okay? Let's look up the word filled right now while we're doing this. I can't say the word because it's long and it's Greek. But it comes from the root word, <clears throat> platho which means to fill entirely, to influence, to supply, to supply, or to imbue. It actually means to fully accomplish also. The word also means to fully accomplish. <clears throat> so the idea is, let's say, uh, I don't know, we've got a jar that is two-thirds of the way full. And when we play through the jar, we fill it so that every nook and cranny of that jar is now filled with water to the point where it overflows it and covers the outside of it. You guys with me? So the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit means the work that was inward has now burst forth outward and has now covered the entire vessel. Okay, what did Jesus say? He's going to baptize us with the Holy Spirit. We looked at that word earlier, which means to fully immerse. So we have the inward work, the in us, and then we have this filling, which fills us all the rest of the way and completely covers us. We are baptized in the Holy Spirit, fully immersed. Every part of us, inside and out, is now covered. And then, where are we? Chapter 2, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Verse 5, now there were Jews living in Jerusalem. Devout men from every nation. How many nations were represented? Every. There were Jews living in Jerusalem. Devout men from every nation under heaven. There was a conference going on. Isn't that interesting? Why? That's why I need to go read about Pentecost. There's a reason why all of these devout, devout men from every nation under heaven were there in that room or in that area at the exact right time that the Holy Spirit rushes in. It's an appointment. It's a divine appointment. Holy Spirit's like, I know the day I'm coming because I know when they're all going to be there. And the Holy Spirit rushes in the room and when this sound occurred, there was a sound, okay? Because we say up here in verse, or in chapter, yeah, verse 2, there was a heaven came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. Has anybody ever been in a hurricane or in a tornado? I've never been in a tornado, but I've been in a hurricane. And I've heard tornado wind is like deafening in comparison to hurricane wind. Like a very big freight train going right behind you. There you go. That's the kind of sound that's going on inside this upper room. So you can imagine what it sounds like outside. When the sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. Remember this. Tongues were given to them. And it says, it says that the tongues were distributed. Okay? So in other words, let's, I don't know, 30, 20 people, 15, 20, 30 people in this room. Okay. It's as if a, a flame of fire that sounds like a wind comes in the room and then distributes itself. Bam. Each one of us has this flame of fire on our heads. It, all, it, it was one when it came in, and then it got distributed out over every one of the heads. Okay? So you got a flame of fire over each one of them. And that tongue, it's a tongue of fire. Actually, that's what they call, like, if you look at a fire and you see, like, the, it's actually called a tongue. Okay? That's where they get this term. And we begin to speak in these other languages, these other tongues. And they heard each one speaking in his own language. Verse 7. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Why? 
are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? Okay, that's like in today's language. <laughs> Aren't all of these redneck West Virginians? <laughs> really, that's kind of what it's like. Sorry for anyone, that, but I could say Texans or Tennesseans, depending on where you're from. The point is this: Galileans were not known as the most articulate, educated types. Okay, Galileans were considered a little more of the backwoods, a little more salt of the earth. These were the fishermen. These were the, and if anybody's been out of the water long, I'll tell you, these sailors don't exactly have the greatest language, and the most educated terminologies. They're salt of the earth guys, okay? And these are Galileans. And the, the term speaking in their own language of verse 6 is an eloquence. It's as if they're speaking in the Queen's English when they're speaking in this other language. And they're like, wait a minute. We are hearing these backwoods, salt of the earth, barely can speak Hebrew guys, speaking in the most fluent, highest form of our language. How can this be? How is it that each one of us hear them in our own language to which we were born? They ask it again. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. It's a lot of people, a lot of different kinds of people, all speaking different languages. We hear them in our own tongues speaking something very specific of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? Others were mocking and saying they're full of sweet wine. What did the Holy Spirit's main, what did Jesus say the Holy Spirit's main role was going to be? We talked about it just five minutes ago. I drew it on the board. To go to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. What are the tongues for? To reach the ends. To reach the ends of the earth. The main role of the Holy Spirit is to make us witnesses in every nation. In our own city, which means someone right now, if you're baptized, fully imbued with this power, then you have a very specific anointing, power from God to reach Chambersburg. Some of you in this room do. Others of you have been anointed, baptized, to reach the most remotest parts of the earth. That's what it's for. Now, Jesus made it easy this day. He comes into the room in the power of the Spirit, gives them all languages, and then also gathers everyone from all those countries I just read to you right in their laps. We're going to start this thing. We're going to make it easy for you to start. I'm going to bring them all to you. So he baptizes them, fills them up, overflows all over their lives, and they don't even know what they're doing. It's like, okay, here it's transformative. Here it's time. We've talked about it. Here it's a growth process. This, in an instant. They're learning and speaking a language. No need for hooked on phonics. It's just <laughs> happening in a moment. They're speaking other languages at the highest level. Okay? This has happened to many people. Has anybody ever been prayed over to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and receive this a prayer language or a, or a tongue? Yeah? Okay. Um, quick story of this. I got saved at Chippensburg University campus. And about two weeks after I got saved, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I began hearing all these stories about tongues and languages and all this kind of stuff. And the night that I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, one of the guys was saying, let me just give you a testimony of how I know this is real. Because I spent two weeks without Holy Spirit and tongues and all this kind of stuff. And they start talking about this. And it sounds pretty freaky to me. I'm just going to tell you right now. This sounds like, sounds pretty unnecessary. Sounds a little out of, the, out of the box, a little crazy. He says, well, I'll just tell you what I'm thinking. So I was walking. On the Shippensburg campus, I don't know what it's like now because there's been so many changes to it, but the uh, library sits here facing east, and there used to be this uh, sidewalk that would run diagonal across a court, huge courtyard right in front of the library and down to the other side of where the Union Building is. And uh, the gentleman that was t telling me this story, he was a senior in, in college, he said he was walking down this sidewalk and he was praying in tongues filled with the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues, just like these guys were. And I guess he didn't realize that it was coming out of his mouth. He thought he was praying internally. He was actually praying out of his mouth. And he's just walking along, and he's praying. 
And then the person behind him whips around and says, what did you say? And the guy's like, oh my gosh. He's like, he's like oh, I'm gonna get kicked. There was this uh, African-American girl. Turns to him and says, what did you say? He goes, I don't know. He, he doesn't know what to say because this is kind of new for him too. And he's praying in tongues and this girl's like, almost like looking at him with this fire in his eyes saying, what did you say? And he doesn't know what he said. He's just praying in tongues. And so he says, I don't know what I said. She goes, yes, you do. You know what you said. What did you say? She goes, actually, no, this is what she said. She said, say it again. He just stood there for like five, ten seconds. He didn't know what to do. And so he, she said, say it again. And so he just started praying his prayer language again. And her eyes get so wide. And she goes, you are speaking my native language from Africa. And you are glorifying and talking about the Lord and tell, telling me about Jesus in my native language. Oh. I mean, I'm getting chills right now just thinking about it because I remember this story like it was the first time I heard it. And he led her to the Lord right there. Right there, right in front of the library, leads her to the Lord right on the sidewalk. People are walking by because he's speaking his language. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, we have, as a church, have kind of taken this thing and... We've used it in a lot of wrong ways. Okay, we've used it to beat each other up. We've used it to charismania ourselves to death. But the real main role of this thing is to bring forth the power of the Holy Spirit into the earth and to bring nations together. Now, you will see throughout Acts, and I don't have the time today, can I just give you the verses? You mind if I just shoot you verses for you to go look at later? Give me a second. Acts chapter 4, verse 8 and verse 31. Acts chapter 6, verse 3 and verse 5. Hold on. 4, 8 and 31. Okay. 6, verse 3 and verse 5. Chapter 7, verse 55. Chapter 8, verse 17. Chapter 9, verse 17. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> chapter 11, verse 15. Chapter 13, verse 9, and chapter, oh, and 13, verse 52. You'll actually find other ones there. I just gave you a few. You'll start to seed those in. Where you start to see that people are filled with the Holy Spirit. There's different times where Peter's just preaching. He's not even preaching about the Holy Spirit. He's just preaching about Jesus, and the Holy Spirit just falls on everybody that's listening to him preach. And they all start speaking in other tongues. And at one point, it's people that are Gentiles. And he's thinking to himself, oh, my gosh. The Holy Spirit's now falling on Gentiles. God, you're getting a little out of control here. They're not Jews. Mm -hmm. And they forgot what he told them back in chapter 1. That this was going to happen for all the earth to come to him. Samaria and the uttermost, remotest parts of the earth. It was for everybody. And so he comes back to the disciple and he goes, Up, oh, gigs up. It's for everybody. <laughs> That's what he says to him. He comes back, read it. Comes back to him and says, Guys, it fell on them just like it fell on us. It's not just for Jews. It's not just for us select few who walk with them. It's for everybody. I, he just proved it. I'm just preaching. I'm just telling people what I'm supposed to tell them. And the Holy Spirit falls on them, and they start speaking in tongues too. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the dunamis. And then there's other places, and we could keep going here, where it says that the Holy Spirit was so strong upon Peter that when he walks by somebody and his shadow like right in here, as my shadow passes over Courtney, the guy gets healed. That was never happening to Peter before this experience in Acts chapter 2. None of that was happening. None of that. When he walks up to the beggar at the gate, at the beautiful gate, and he says, hey, look, what does he say? Silver and gold? Got none of it. But what I have, I give you. Walk. Woof! He gets up, he starts running around, he runs right into the temple, starts praising God, and everybody's like, how did that happen? Holy Spirit, power, authority, witnesses, it changes the atmosphere. The whole reason for the baptism of upon you is to release 
people from the darkness of the lies that God is not real. How do you do that? The miraculous. This, this baptism of the Holy Spirit is for one main purpose, to evangelize the earth, to bring people into a realization. And the reason why I talk about it, we have used it in the wrong way, is that we have turned the baptism inward and we use our gifts on each other. Think about this. Most of the time, if we operate in our gifts, where do we operate in them? In the church. And the whole point of the baptism is that we would go out. He says, do not leave until we only use our gifts when we're here. It's the exact opposite of the spirit that God gave it to us in. He said, once you get it, go. Don't stay in Jerusalem. Go out. Go all over the place. But eventually, if you guys know the book of Acts very well, you know that they don't go. That they stay. And so God has to bring persecution. And at first, they're just like, oh, Lord God, we pray that you fill us with confidence and boldness. That's one of the verses I gave you in Acts chapter 4, so that we can withstand this persecution. And he does. And he gives them a grace. So he grows the population in Jerusalem. But eventually, he's like, i got to get them out. They're not going. They're not leaving. They're not going to all of these parts. So he causes such persecution to come upon them that they have to flee and go to all the parts of the earth. And then in AD 70, the Romans come in and tear up Jerusalem. Tear down the temple. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. So, the power of the Holy Spirit has been given to us to witness. Okay? And this is the reason. That's why there's an inward work and an outward work. The inward work is what's happening here. So really, what church is really supposed to be about, what goes on here is an encouragement inside the body of Christ for one another, for the work of God to have its full weight and its full finish. What's supposed to be going on inside the house is this. What's supposed to be going outside these walls is this. Power, authority, prayer. We wait for people to come in here and then we pray for the sick. What? Your sickness, believer, son and daughter of God, is healed this way. Their sickness is healed here. And then they, when their sickness is, uh, you know, when their lame legs are made strong, when their sickness leaves, then they're like, God is real. And then immediately this process starts. Hello? That's how this thing's supposed to work. We have turned it all inward. And that's, honestly, I think when something turns inward and it's all about mega church or all of this stuff that's happening inside a building, God will actually cause something to happen, just like he did in Jerusalem, to force them to go out. Because that's what this is all about. You want to say something? Yeah, like, since you are an owner, and if you are going out, and, like, when you go out and you talk to people, like, how's your food, blah, 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 um, do you ever run into customers and ask, like, they talk to you, and do you say, can I pray with you, and do you do it right there? Absolutely. You do. Oh my gosh, I can't tell you how many times. I can't count the number of times. I've either laid hands on a guest while they're eating the best burger in the world. Do <laughs> <laughs> you pray out loud? So right out loud. Right out loud. I don't pray in tongues because yeah. I don't speak English. <laughs> yeah. Hello, can I just tell you it's that common sense. If someone speaks English, pray in English. That's the only. Um, that's the that's only great. Okay, right but there's some charismaniacs. <laughs> no, so far. No, you guys need to hear this. This is really important. There's some charismaniacs who think as soon as they have to pray for somebody, they start praying in tongues. You shut down the hearts of most believers. You go read it in 1 Corinthians 14. Paul says this. Do not do that. People will just think you're crazy. Prophesy. Mm. Hello. Yeah. That's what it says. When someone speaks English, you prophesy in English and cut to the quick. Go back into your prayer closet and pray in your prayer language. Bring forth the power of the Holy Spirit from within you. But I want to tell you, no, but we pray. I pray for guests all the time. We just prayed for an employee today, right? In the would back. I get in trouble for doing that? Who does? Like You need to understand because it is not your business. So I, it's my business. I, I go through the yeah. same. I, I, yeah. What do you there, do? There's, there's a limit. There's been tons right? of people. Like there was just a lady who sat in my chair the other day and just cried because her. <sighs> she's going to cry. Her 50 year old son died and she's sitting in my chair crying and I want to pray with her. But like I have 
a thousand other people that's mm -hmm. like so you don't think I don't that know I would have not been accepted was it you did think it would have just been strange because the culture's never experienced that before or do you think it's literally unlawful in your area all of that so you I'm not, not afraid to do it it's just the people that I work with don't really I don't know where they stand in that well I know where some of them are. and then I don't know if I would get in trouble like I want to but I don't know where, because my district manager always tells me to not talk about it. Is what because I always have the customers that want to talk about it, so I talk about it, and then I get in trouble for not talking about it. And I'm just like, you get in trouble for not talking about it. Like, no, I get in. I don't get in trouble for not talking about it. I get not in trouble, but I get it's said to me in the form of just be careful how much religion okay. you talk about okay. in your chair but I can't help it it just comes out it's like I can't stop it I will tell you first of all they're drawn to you mm -hmm. this this work that's going on, on the inside of you is magnetic you'll start to draw people that need what's on the inside of you mm -hmm. Ask I, the need for job. Huh? <laughs> I need my job I need my job can you let me finish okay. <laughs> ask for the Lord's creativity on how to share it with them in such a way where it brings life to them, it releases the spirit, it releases the power of the spirit into them creatively. I think you can bring life to them without, hey, by the way, do you know what Acts chapter 2 says? <laughs> I don't think you have to do that at all. Talk in your language. And Talk in hairstylist time, language. She doesn't have to make a big scene about it. Like, it doesn't have to be you, like, right. you know, drawing all this attention to yourself. You can still be speaking life into that brain of them. Yep. So, just encourage them. Do you know prophecy, this thing called prophecy that we've been talking about, is just encouragement, edification, and strengthening. That's what it is. It's those okay, three things. Do you do that. Now you ask the Lord to empower those. That's a gift. It's a gift of the Spirit to do that. Ask the Lord to empower that gift to bring life to them. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Or you just... <laughs> well, what can you say to your boss who I've heard more times than I can count on my ten fingers, situations I've heard of where bosses will write you up or fire you for even bringing it up. Then you can't do it. I mean, like, mm -hmm. it's like you now she said, or one of you, either you or her, had said something, but I think you said to pray about how you can bring it up. Mm -hmm. But even if you do that, though, some bosses are so picky, that's like, oh, they pick up on what you're doing. Sure. It's like, it's like a curse. And it's yeah, I, th I think you need to respect the environment you're in, guys. I think there's a way to honor the environment and also honor the Lord. Okay? If someone's really hungry, then say, hey, hey, when you and I punch out, let's go talk about this. Hey, how about you and I go grab a cup of coffee afterwards? Or, hey, call me on the phone later. I want to pray with you. Things like that. Those, those are creative ways that you can still connect with them without breaking the law. Okay. Go ahead. It is all in how you say it. If I know that somebody believes, like I do, then of course I say the words God and Jesus and stuff. If they don't, I just let those words out. But I still mm -hmm. say yeah. the same thing to them. <laughs> they just don't realize <laughs> what it is. I will tell you, though, at some point in time, you got to say the name. Yeah. 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 you yeah. got to say the name. And you'll know when their hunger increases. Like mm -hmm. these guys... After they started speaking in tongues, they were like, how is this happening? How, how is this possible? They're, oh, they must be drunk. And Peter stands up. I didn't read you his sermon. He said, let me tell you exactly how this is happening. They asked. Okay. When you see that hunger grow, that's the time to use the name. If it's a one-time thing, though, I especially do that. Like if, it's, if I know I'm never going to see a person again, I just encourage them and I kind of just drop you know like thus saith the Lord you should get married tomorrow no, no. Uh, so like we, like we were in Buffalo Wild Wings one time and I took this girl and I just started talking and the, but see the more I talked to her like the more she got I could like, see her hunger she was like dying for more and I knew that like I can't give you more after this like because I'm leaving so then I was like but the Lord really wants you know what I mean like so yeah, but I understand, like, the blend of that, both of those. Like, you sometimes, at some point you have to say it, but then at some point you just have to, like, 
Yeah. yeah let's, let's be careful that we don't strategize the Holy Spirit right out of the deal. Okay? Um, these guys were not planning strategies in their meetings. They were simply being led by the Spirit. Don't forget what Roman 8 says. He who is led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Okay? Don't plan what you're going to say. Don't strategize how you're going to do it. I think we strategize God right out of so much of our moments in the, in the workplace, in the marketplace, in the world. My best piece of advice to you is to pray regularly. To be in prayer regularly. To be asking the Lord for opportunities and for wisdom and insight. So that when you are, he even tells his disciples, he says, look, you're going to be dragged before authorities and rulers. And I'm warning you, do not prepare ahead. <coughs> he warns them, do not prepare ahead. The Holy Spirit will give you utterance when you are called into that place. That is the best piece of advice I can give you. Pray. Constantly prepare your vessel, your person, for every encounter. And I believe the Lord will give you exact wisdom and discernment to know what to do. So be careful we don't... I mean, I love all of this advice. So please, I'm not shutting any of it down. But I'm, I'm warning you to be careful not to strategize the Lord right out of something. Because you've got a plan. This is what I'm going to do the next time that happens. No. Just be available. Just be available. It's almost like just listening with everything you've got for those opportune moments. You know, because it's not going to be everyone. It's not going to be every person that's sitting in your chair. But yeah. if you're like really tuned in and listening with everything you've got, then you'll know when those moments are. I know I end up crying. <laughs> I mean, I think it's just... Can I tell you, your tears could be as prophetic as any other thing that could come right. out of you. When they just see you weeping for them. When they see you broken for them. That might be enough. It really might be good. Yeah, I just think it's it's all a process of learning of when we step down and we allow him to step out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, when we don't have to have the answer and we just allow him to do his thing out of in us. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I work at a preschool and this one thing I've learned is you don't always have to talk to every parent and say, Jesus, 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 for them to know that you're a Christian or for mm -hmm. them to know that there's something different about you. Um, and there's a little kid at my work. Um, I love him to death. He's one of my favorite kids. And I've had a relationship with him and his family for two years. Just talk to them. I don't sit there. and I mean, they know I go to church and I'm a Christian, but I don't spout Jesus every chance I get to him. I just live my life, and that's evident of that. And um, the little kid's uh, grandfather actually passed away about a week and a half ago. And obviously I went to the funeral. And um, the little boy, his dad's in jail, his mom's in rehab, and his mom came back for the funeral. And... Um, he left his mom during the funeral to come sit on my lap. Mm -hmm. And so it breaks my heart, but I love him to death. And I don't have to sit there and say, hey, let's talk about Jesus to a four-year-old. But he said, I wanted to come sit with you because I know you love me. Mm -hmm. So it's like, Aww. yeah, it, and that's not to like, oh, I'm so great. It's the fact that just living your life and being who you are, like, you don't always have to just Jesus, 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 like, they will know us by our love. That's one of the main things. So when you're, like, there's times where I sat there with parents crying just because of stuff, but you don't know the impact that that has on them to see that you were broken for them, too. So. What you've done there, Katrina, is you've allowed that process to begin to really have its way in your life, mm -hmm. and love's coming forth. And you don't have to preach that. Yeah. Okay. You are that. That's the beauty of when, when this combines with this, you don't need a lot of words. Mm -hmm. You've got love and spirit and life flowing from you because of the power of God in you. And then you've got the power of God on you. It finds you. Just walk in the room. Mm -hmm. Seriously, guys. Just love people. Just be with them. And all the ministry that needs to take place will take place. Oftentimes when I find I have to use a ton of words, the spirit's not doing a lot. It's the truth. Any other thoughts? enjoy when they come up to me and say, I want what you have. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Can you tell them? Can you tell them? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you, guys. I love you. <laughs> <laughs>